Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now about food sacrifice to idols, idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. Since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God, for we are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your lights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees for if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, wouldn't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. For you sin against them in this way, and wound your weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. This is the word of the Lord. Whoops. Okay. I did that on purpose. I'm just kidding. <laughs> good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone. Uh, it's great to be able to gather together, uh, both online and in person, to worship the Lord on this Lord's Day. Uh, please bow with me as we pray for the word. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, just bow before you. We come humbly before you now. And we thank you, Lord. Uh, we just thank you for just who you are. Lord, um, as we gather this morning for worship, we are reminded through the worship service, through the songs, the praise, uh, through even the confession, through the promise of forgiveness. Um, Father, th- through the entire service, the offering, we're just reminded of your goodness, your faithfulness, of your salvation, of your grace and love to all of us. And so, Father, we uh, pray that as we hear your word now, um, that you would just help us to be attentive, that, you know, our hearts may respond to what you have for us this morning. So help us, Father, to to not be uh, distracted by the other things, but that we would stay focused wholly on you, that we can really devote and commit this time to you to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, the passage that we read today in the First Corinthians chapter eight is I'll be uh, examining and expositing with you today. Paul deals with a great issue within the Christian community um, about whether it's okay, whether it's good uh, to eat food that has been sacrificed to idols. So we kind of need a little bit of historical context in order for us to understand what's going on here. So in the time of Paul and these Corinthian Christians, it was still common practice for people to be invited into these dining halls in the courtyards where people sacrifice in the temple, right? Like on the side. And they sacrifice food, made sacrifices and offerings to idols. And so there is an idol worship, but in the courtyard was kind of a place where people kind of, you know, hang around, fellowship, uh, gather together to ate together. Uh, It was also common practice for people to buy food and meat in the marketplace that had been previously sacrificed to idols, and now there's kind of leftovers, and so those food are being just sold in the marketplace. So then the issue here is not whether it's okay to worship idols, right? We know that idolatry, worshiping other gods, is not good. It is prohibited But the issue here is whether you can eat certain foods or not, whether it's okay to eat food that has been previously 
previously sacrificed to idols. And so we want an answer. And these Corinthian Christians, they also want an answer. We want an answer that says it's okay or it's not okay. But Paul, he doesn't give us such an answer. He says maybe, sometimes. And so it might confuse some of us to say, well then is it okay or is it not okay? But we must understand as Christian is that there are certain principles, there are certain doctrines of our Christian faith that are unshakable, that are objective, not subjective, but objective, which is the gospel message of Jesus Christ, right? That is objective, or objective, not subjective. It is the truth. The truth of the gospel says that we can only be saved through Jesus Christ alone. Through faith in him, we're saved. And that is an objective truth. That is the truth. And so if there's a dispute that arises and say, is there any other God that we can be, uh, have the salvation from? Can we worship on another God so that we can be saved? Then the answer would be, obviously, no. Like, emphatic no. However, there are some principles in our Christian faith where we apply the truth of these objective truth into different circumstances and scenarios. And the reason why Paul says sometimes and maybe is because in these situations, there's neither right or wrong. There's neither good or bad, but pertaining to each situation, the Christian should do as they are called to do in the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, these type of issues are what we would call adiaphorous. Adiaphorous. This means that when it doesn't pertain to the truth of salvation, then it doesn't really matter. There's no right or wrong. There's no worse or better. But it is as it is in each situation. So let me just give you an example of this, just so that we can have this idea on what adiaphor is really about. Let me ask you this. Apple or Samsung? Some people like to use Apple, like Kaylina, and some people like to use Samsung, like me. Some people like to eat churches, and some people like KFC. For those of you who like to watch basketball, some people like to you know, cheer LeBron James, and some people like Stephen Curry. Same for soccer too. Lionel Messi or Christian Ronaldo? Here's a point. When it comes to salvation, God doesn't love people who use Apple more than he loves people who use Samsung. They're all going to be saved. It's adiaphorous. So this is what Paul says in the scripture today. In verse 8, Paul says this in the passage. But food... It does not bring us near to God. We're no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. And then he continues to validate the claims of the so-called people who are strong in faith in verse 4. He says, They claim an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. Paul says, You're absolutely correct. That is the truth. You're right. You know, there's only one God, one Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when it comes to this food, it doesn't matter if you eat the food or you don't eat the food because you're no better off if you eat it and you're no worse off if you don't eat it. But then he gives a caution in verses 1, 7, and 9. This is what he says. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Paul says it is adiaphorous unless it starts to hinder someone from loving Jesus. When it starts to creep into actual salvation, that's when it stops being adiaphorous, and that's when it starts to become essential. Now, what's the problem here? The problem here is that a lot of so-called strong Christians, 
stronger uh, Christians who are uh, claiming that they are strong because they know more about Jesus Christ, that they're more knowledgeable, they say, Jesus Christ has us free. It's okay to eat any type of food because we're not bound to these laws anymore. We're not bound to these things anymore. Christ has given us Christian liberty. And so let us eat anything because we're now free and everything is clean in Christ. But what Paul is saying is that those who claim to have this knowledge, it becomes, if it becomes a stumbling block to other people, a stumbling block to fellow brothers and sisters, so that they, they just begin to sin against God and, and in their own conscience, he says, then it is no longer Adiophorus. In fact, Paul goes as far as to say in verse 11 that the weaker brother or sister that is led astray because of this knowledge and exercise of these rights becomes destroyed. So now, you're not doing just something that's Adiophorus, but you're now sinning against your brothers and sisters. Not only you're sinning against your brothers and sisters, but you're even sinning against Jesus Christ himself. Now, how can something so insignificant um, as eating food become sin against God? It's not the act of eating the food, but it's because you are causing other people to stumble by eating that food, if you know what I mean. So we see Paul making a case for what is true knowledge. These Corinthians claim that they're mature because they have this knowledge of God. But Paul corrects this misunderstanding by telling the Corinthians that the beginning of knowing God and having true knowledge of God, it doesn't come from the knowledge, but instead it comes from knowing the love of God. Paul says in verse 3 that those who love God are known by God. In other words, those who would claim to be strong as Christians Mature as Christians, they're not mature based on how much they know about who God is or that they have this kind of knowledge of God, but they're mature based on how much they know the love of God, how much they understand that they're known by God. Paul identifies this as a root of all the problems that are going on in Corinthian church right now. The reason why they are divided the reason why the weaker are stumbling because of the stronger, the root of this is because those who claim to be stronger have forgotten the fact that they are first and foremost known by God. They look to those who are weaker and said, are you still not eating this food? Are you still eating that food? Don't you know that we are set free in Christ? Paul says that in doing so, they're a stumbling block. In his comment, Anthony Thistleton, he says, love, rather than knowledge, is a Christian's guide. Love rather than knowledge. So then growing as a Christian doesn't come by merely increasing your knowledge or by asserting your rights because of the knowledge that you have, but it's first by understanding that you are known by God. Paul admonishes those who would think that they are mature Christians because of this knowledge of Christianity. But he says, if you don't love, then you don't know the basics of Christianity, which is the love of God. So let's think about that for a moment. Why would Paul say that? We would kind of expect him to say, well, if you have true knowledge, then you will know the true love as well. But he says, if you really know God, then you will know that you are known by God. In Psalm uh, chapter 139, the psalmist says, For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. We're known by Almighty God. Through all of history, through billions of people, through this great expanse in the universe, and in all of it, Almighty God. 
the Creator knows me. He knows you. He knows all of us. He knows who we are. And this humbles us. This should really humble us. I mean, when we think about the great Almighty God, knowing who we are, doesn't that humble you? Doesn't that humble us? When we think about all of our rights, all of our blessings, all the things that we have, all of our knowledge too, where do they come from? They all come from God. So then in doing whatever they wanted to do, even if they were right, but not loving others, not thinking of others in the process, is not only not Christ-like, but also completely disregards Christ himself. And it just shows how much they don't know who God is because they don't know his love. Christ died not as an act of self-assertion or claiming rights, but as an act of self-giving love for the sake of the other, not least for the weak. Jesus gave all of his rights up so that the weak, that's us, we could be saved. When we think about the salvation that comes from Jesus, we don't think about Jesus asserting his knowledge unto his disciples. Jesus wasn't like, this is what you, what you should do. Like, don't you know that this is the will of God to his disciples? He wasn't like, how come you don't know this? How come you're so foolish? But Jesus, how did he do? He led those disciples with love. He told them about the love of God. He showed the love of God to them. And he ultimately showed the love of God by going on a cross. Though we have the right to choose and be free in Christ, we renounce those rights for the sake of Christ and the advancement of kingdom. So then... If even Christ humbled himself and died for us, why do we often assert our knowledge, our rights over others? It's because of our selfishness, pride, entitlement to boast because we love ourselves so much and we want to be right all the time. And so as Paul states many times that we forget the love of God, We forget how we have come to be who we are. We forget how we have come to know the mystery of the gospel. It's not because of anything that we did. It's not because we're wiser than others, but simply because of God who loves us. I want to point out that for Paul, everything that he did in his life, everything that he encouraged other brothers and sisters to do, was for the edification of the church and building up the body of Christ. And that's exactly what he points to in this chapter today as well. So in verse 1, if we can remember, he says, knowledge pops up. And what does love do? Love builds up. When you love your brother and your sister, it builds them up. What's the point? What's the goal of the church then? It's to come together to build one another up, to edify one another for the sake of Jesus Christ, for his glory. And this is actually all throughout his letters. This is what he writes all throughout his letters. He says, speaking of the same topic in Romans chapter 14, he says, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mature edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. And the message today is the same. Be united. Build each other up in the love of Christ. Edify the body Stop dividing over these meaningless things. The point that Paul makes here is that those who claim to possess this knowledge, they claim that what they are doing is building up their brothers and sisters. Well, I'm just, you know, helping my brother and sister to know what their rights are. 
You know, I'm just helping them overcome their, you know, weak conscience. I'm giving them more knowledge. This is what Paul says in verse 10 and 11. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed in your knowledge. Paul says, you think you're building them up. You think you're edifying your brother and sister, but what you're actually doing is you're destroying them. So what they thought that they were doing was they thought they, thought they were doing good for Christ. They thought they were doing it for his brothers and sisters to build them up, build the kingdom of God. But Paul says, well, because you're not doing it with love, because you're not doing it for the sake of God and his kingdom, he says, you're actually tearing them down. You're destroying them. In verse 10, the word embolden in the Greek is okarai maistai. It's a word that also means to build up, to edify. And I don't know about you, but I don't think it's a coincidence that Paul uses this word and then says, you think you're building them up. Okarai maistai. But you're actually destroying them. You're actually defiling them all in the name of God. As you notice, Paul is almost is sarcastic in his comment. That those who would claim to be stronger in faith and more mature, more knowledgeable, he says, their knowledge is actually tearing people down and destroying them rather than building them up. For Paul, it is a sin against Jesus Christ himself. If you're more knowledgeable, if you haven't been in the faith for a longer time, if you know God more in his word, yet you neglect those brothers and sisters around you to love them as God loves them, it is a sin against Christ himself. Not loving, not sacrificing, not building up those around you, he says it's a direct offense against Christ himself. Paul's argument is that those who would claim to be stronger can build up their brothers and sisters, not by forcing their knowledge onto others, but by loving them as God loves them through Christ. So Bible study is great. Devotionals are necessary. All these things are good and necessary. It's really important for us to do these things so that we can grow in faith and to grow in the knowledge of Christ. But if we do not have the love of God, these things, they're all meaningless. And so we must daily immerse ourselves in the love of God. Daily remind ourselves that I am known by God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, Who are you? Who were you before you met Jesus? Who were you before you were saved? You were foolish. You were nothing of this world. You're not wise. But we, as children of God, we have to remember, remember and daily remind ourselves who we were before Jesus Christ saved us. We were nothing, but we were headed to death, destruction, but it's because of God and the love of God that we're able to be saved. So then in verse 13, Paul, he finally says, Therefore, if I, what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. This is Paul's answer today. He goes through these 12 verses of should you eat or should you not eat? And in verse 13, this is what he says. He says, if it causes my brother and sister to stumble, he says, I'm not going to eat it. Not only will I not eat it, I will abstain from it forever. I'll never eat it again. Why? Not because I can't. Not because I don't have the right to. Not because I'm not supposed to. But for the sake of my brother, for the sake of my sister, because... I love my brothers and sisters more than my right to do something, more than my right to eat meat. He says, I'll gladly give it up if it means that I'll edify and build up my brothers and sisters. 
On the other hand, if we are not willing to give up something, Christian liberty or some type of right for the edification of others by saying, you know, that's just the way I am. That's just the way I learn things. That's just the way the culture is now here. Then we're just allowing the love of God to be hidden from our lives. But you know what's great about the gospel is that it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter your culture. It doesn't matter of your, your upbringing, your background. The love of God surpasses all of that. And this is why we're able to gather from all nations and all tongues, all people groups, everyone from whatever the past or culture that you are from, we're able to gather together and be united. Why? Because of the love of God. Our God is one and Lord of all. And so Chrysostom, he comments, it is foolish in the extreme that we should esteem as so entirely beneath our notice those that Christ so greatly care for that he should have even chosen to die for them as not even to abstain from meat on their account. We come to the Lord's table this morning remembering Christ dying for us on the cross so that we could be saved and have eternal life, so that we could be here, so that we can worship him like this. And so, let us be people that elevate being by known by God. Elevate the love of God more in our lives, above any rights that we may have, or rights that we are even entitled to, so that we will be able to exercise our rights the way that Jesus Christ did by laying ourselves down for our brothers and sisters. Let me finish with Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and com compassion that make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love and being one in the spirit of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others in your relationship with one another. Have the mindset, the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Amen.